I said, hey, you, let's do some Diffy Q. If something's looking blurry, then we'll bring it into view. I said, hey, you. Check it out. Welcome. Let's do some Diffy Q. In this video, we'll talk about the delta function and impulse response. Let's get started. First, we'll look at the concept of a rectangular pulse. Now, suppose we have this pulse in yellow, or this function in yellow, where we are zero up until we hit the T value. Then we're at a height M, some positive number, for some time until we reach time B. And then after that, it's zero. This is called a pulse because we go along, there's no activity, all of a sudden it jumps up and then jumps back down. So there's a surge of activity, if you will. Mathematically, what this would look like is a combination of two heavy side functions. One, u of t minus zero, which we may just write as u of t. Alternatively, u t minus b. If you take the difference between these two functions, what you'll get is from 0 to b, you'll have in here a height of 1, and then elsewise it'll be 0. We take and multiply that by m to get a height of m. This expression represents this pulse. Now it's a rectangular pulse for obvious reasons, because it's a rectangle. You can have other types of pulses. You could have a triangular one where you're 0 for a while, you spike up and then back. You could have a pulse like this, but of course, here we have a rectangle. You could also do things such as have really any function you like for an amount of time. For example, you could be zero for a while and then let's see be cosine and then go back. To this is maybe something that looks more akin to a heartbeat. Now we're going to think of the delta function as in some sense a limit of the following scenario. Suppose that you have a pulse that is non-zero from t value of zero to t value of and its height is 1 over b. If we compute the area of this rectangle, the base is b, the height is 1 over b, 1 over b times b is obviously 1. Now let's say we want to move b closer to 0, we're going to move it to the left, but we want to keep the same area the whole time. You could imagine moving b for a little while and getting something like this, where 1 over b, since b is smaller, Dividing by a smaller amount means we have a larger number. And the area, of course, is still b times 1 over b, so we get an area of 1. Imagine pushing it even closer. As you push b really close to 0, 1 over b is going to be very, very high. And you can imagine taking it to the limit where b goes to 0, and that correspondingly pushes 1 over b to be infinitely high. Something like this, where our pulse is now zero everywhere except for right over t is equal to zero, in which case, since we have an infinitely small width, we need an infinitely high height. Now, this is just an intuitive idea. We'll define the delta function more formally, but for now, this is the good idea to keep in mind, that there is just this briefest of a non-zero spike, if you will. And it's an infinitely high spike because it's for an infinitely short amount of time. Now in the first case, on the left here, we would call this a pulse, kind of a long, low pulse. We would call the middle case also a pulse. And then we would call this last case an impulse. And this is what we're going to think of as our delta function, delta of t, where in some sense, this is not totally accurate, but in some sense, this function is zero when t is anything but zero, and it's infinity otherwise. Now this can occur at places besides t is equal to zero. We could define a slightly modified impulse delta function where there's a spike at, where there's a spike over t is equal to c, infinitely high spike. And this we would call delta of t minus c. In both cases, there's an impulse, which we take to mean uh, Sort of infinitely high or large pulse over an infinitely short amount of time, essentially zero time, and that we'll call delta. If it's shifted over to C, we'll call it delta minus. Now let's look at how the heavy side function and the delta function compare. Suppose here we've drawn a heavy side function where it's shifted over by C. The heavy side function is zero up until a certain point, namely C here. After that, it's equal to we denote this by u of t minus c. 
Now let's say we correspondingly graph delta t minus c. You may notice that there's somewhat of a pattern here. Namely, notice everywhere here we have zero, we have zero here. Everywhere here we have the value one, but it's horizontally flat, we also. And then at this point c, where there's all of a sudden this big jump from zero up to one, we now have infinity. Think about the derivative of the heavy side function. We can see that the derivative everywhere here for t less than c, there's a derivative of zero. We have a horizontal curve. That corresponds to zero here. So since the derivative is zero here, we have a value of zero here. Notice for t that is strictly greater than c, we have also a zero derivative. It's horizontal curve, and that zero derivative corresponds to a zero value down here. So outside of t is equal to c, this graph exactly represents the derivative of this function. The derivative is zero here, zero here, and notice we have zero here for the value. At the point c, or t equals c, notice if you were to try to find the curve of a tangent line there, in order to connect a tangent line in some sense, what you would need is an infinitely high slope tangent line. Your tangent line would be vertical. So that corresponds to a slope that we may call infinity, which is represented here. Again, this is an intuitive thing. We're not formally declaring this to be true, but a very good way to think about the delta function is as the derivative of the heavy side. So here we say, quote unquote, the derivative of the heavy side. And that we would denote by delta t. Now that we've given some intuition on what just this delta function is, let's give it some more formality. So we'll say the delta function delta is an object. So I really should have quotes here. Delta quote unquote function is an object. It's not a function in the way that we usually think of them as a map from one set to the other, just quite simple. But it's a more generalized function, if you will. For now, just think of it as some object such that if you were to take this delta shifted by C and you were to integrate it, the integral will be equal to one. Very much in the same way how we had that constant area of one before. We can think of all that area of one being somehow concentrated in this infinitely thin but infinitely tall rectangle. Again, that's just the intuition, but we can see it reflected here in the formality. Besides this fact that integrating this delta function over the whole real line gives us one, we also have that if we integrate it times any function, what we'll get out is the function value at the shifted amount. So these are the two properties that this object has, and they both have to deal with integration. Now let's see how the delta function interacts with convolution. Suppose we convolve some function f with the delta function. By the definition of convolution, when you have the convolution, it's going to be this. We take the integral from zero to t, t is the independent variable. We take the first function, which is just f here, a general function, we haven't specified what it is. We now use a new variable that we'll integrate with respect to. Here, we'll call it a, purple. Then we take the other function, in this case, delta, and we take t minus this new variable that we integrate with respect to. Now, let's write it without any color, or just a minor amount of color to keep track of the. Remember, here we are integrating with respect to a. a is the variable. t is just a constant. The delta function is such that we can switch these two. We can go from t minus a to a minus t. And if you're curious why that's true, you can imagine taking first delta of t versus delta of negative t, you'll find it's the same value. And then beyond that, whether you shift from one direction or the next, won't matter. You can do a little bit of playing around to show that this is true. It's not, not too hard. And it's also true that since all the essential data is contained or occurs in this interval, it doesn't matter whether we integrate from zero to t or more generally from negative infinity. Now, the reason we've set it up this way is notice t is a constant, which might be a little confusing because we looked at it just previously as t minus c. But now think of t as the c, 
think of A as T because A is the thing that varies. So this is like T was, this T is like C was. But now based on the definition we just saw, we have that this is F of T. That's how this object, this delta function, function quote unquote is defined. So this is just from the definition we saw on the previous batch of slides. So what's interesting about this is if we take the convolution of F with the delta function, you get exactly back f of t. So in some sense, this is a quote unquote function or object that once you convolve it, it acts like an identity. It just keeps f the same as it was. It doesn't really change f. You start with f, you convolve it with delta, and then you just get back f. Again. Now we've been talking about the Laplace transform. So let's look at what the Laplace of the delta function is. Suppose we have delta of t minus c, c is greater than zero, and we take the Laplace transform of that. Suppose we want to compute the Laplace transform of delta function shifted by c, where c is greater than zero. First, by the definition of the Laplace transform, that's going to be whatever function you have here. You're going to integrate that from zero to infinity. And there should be an e to the negative s t here. So that's a typo, but that'll be fixed in the next line. So here we have e to the negative st. That's just a typo from here. That should be here. Now let's let f of t be equal to e to the negative st. I'm just going to relabel this. Just by the relabeling, we have that f of t is equal to e to the negative st, which is this here. And now we'll again extend the limits of integration from 0 to infinity rather the negative infinity. Because c is positive, all the interesting non-zero part of this will happen in zero to infinity so we can extend it without really adding any this equality is true the reason we want these new limits of infinity is so that we can use the definition comes from how we define formally the delta function and if we have this set up what happens is that we simply get f of c now what is f of c we just relabeled it we said f of t is equal to e to the negative s, and we relabeled it so that we could fit this with the previous definition. Now to reiterate, there is a typo up here that should be e to the negative s t. The video is such that it's gonna be hard to go back and edit that, so just make note of that, that there should be an e to the negative. Finally, if we replace f of c with this substitution, where f of t is e to the negative s t, we of course replace t with c, and what we get is e to the negative sc. Now, depending on what c is, we get a different value here. And in particular, we'll note that if we have delta of t minus zero, or just delta of t, that that's going to be one after we take the loss transform. Now I'll make note of it because of the way this video is structured. This should be. Now let's do some computations where we involve the delta function. Suppose that we have the differential equation x double prime plus 2x prime plus x is equal to delta t, and we have initial value information where x of 0 and x prime of 0 are equal. We'll start positioning it so that we can do our work, and the first thing we'll do is take the Laplace transform. Because of the linearity of the Laplace transform, we're able to write it like so, and because of what we just showed with the Laplace transform of the delta function, we get e to the negative s times zero because there's a shift of zero with the delta function. That of course will be e to the negative zero or e to the zero and that of course is one. Meanwhile, if we write out what these derivatives are when taking the Laplace transform, we get the following expression on the left -hand side, which can be simplified because x of zero is zero, x prime of zero is zero. That means these terms are zero, this term is zero. Finally, that Let's us see that x, that the Laplace of x is this expression, which can be factored, and now is just like 1 over s squared, which is the Laplace transform of t, except there's a shift of negative 1 to go from s to s plus 1. When we take the inverse Laplace transform, then what we'll end up with is that x is equal to t e to the negative t. That comes from the Laplace transform table from the fact that we have here the Laplace where we can think of this as the Laplace transform of P 
but shifted by one. So if we take the Laplace transform of T, what we get is one over S squared, but notice we have one over S plus one squared. So it's like we took S and we replaced it with S plus. And again, that can be found in the Laplace transform table. And now let's look at a second example. Suppose here we wanna just compute what is the inverse Laplace transform of this expression? We'll start by saying this expression is equal to e to the negative 4s, and that is multiplied by the following rational expression, where we note that the numerator and the denominator have the same degree. If they have the same degree and we want to simplify this, we'll divide out. Here notice that we were able to take the denominator, which is s cubed plus 9s, we are able to partition out part of the numerator so that we have s cubed plus 9s, same as the denominator, plus 2s squared plus 9. So we partitioned, and now we divide, giving us this 1 instead of s cubed plus 9s over itself. We'll also factor the s cubed plus 9s as obviously s times s squared. From there, we'll use partial fraction decomposition. That will amount to a over s plus bs plus c over s squared plus From there, one can use partial fraction decomposition, that algebraic method, to find a, b, and c. And if you do so, you'll find that a is equal to 1, b is equal to 1, and c. We'll skip that for now for the sake of concentrating on this material. We now have a new expression for what was inside the inverse Laplace transform argument. In particular, this expression can be written in this way. Now we can distribute the e to the negative 4s, and from there, we can say the inverse Laplace transform of this whole expression is the same as the inverse Laplace transform of this, which by linearity, we can rewrite like so. Notice there are no constants to pull out, but that's okay. And now the first inverse Laplace transform is gonna use one rule. These two are gonna use another rule. When you have an e to the negative something s by itself, you'll use one rule. Whenever you have an e to the negative something s times a Laplace transform of some other function, for example, this is clearly the Laplace transform of one. This is clearly the Laplace transform of cosine three e. Since we know what the inverse Laplace transform of these are, since they're getting multiplied by e to the negative four s, that will use a certain, which is different than if we just have e to the negative 4s by itself. So these two together will use one rule, the cyan term will use different. We've written the rule here that the Laplace transform of delta t minus c, which we saw earlier, is e to the negative cs. Notice that's just isolated a single exponential. Meanwhile, over here, if you have an exponential times a Laplace transform of some other function, the inverse Laplace transform is going to be the heavy side function times the function you would have gotten, but shifted by c. So notice these are both shifted. So you have two different rules, a case where the exponential is isolated, and then a case where the exponential is multiplied by the Laplace transform of some other function. Working through that, we obtain that the first one is delta t minus four. The next inverse Laplace transform is simply u t minus four. That's because this is the Laplace transform of one and you can't shift one at all, or shifting it doesn't change it, so it's just one, and now that there's a shift. Here, the Laplace transform as mentioned, inverse Laplace transform, is cosine three, and then notice here there's a shift of c. And c is four, we shift it by four. And instead of doing three t, we do three t minus, t is replaced with t minus. And then of course we have the shift here, which we now this leads us to a notion of impulse response. If we have a linear differential operator where t is the independent variable and x is the independent variable, we can essentially say the following thing, which at first glance may not seem all that important at all, but once we think and discuss it for a bit, I hope that it will become more clear why it is so important. Suppose you have a differential equation that looks like where you have L of x, L being a linear differential operator, is equal to delta of t. You also have initial value information essentially as much as you need. x of zero, x prime of zero, et cetera, et cetera. That will be necessary when you take derivatives. If we suppose 
that will be necessary for the sake of computing Laplace transform as well as it being exactly equal to zero we need that for this particular case if it has solution x delta and then you take the same differential equation at least on the left but now you change from the delta quote unquote function to any other continuous function and you have the same initial value information and in particular it's all zero we can now say exactly what the solution is it's the x delta solution we had here convolved with f of t where f of t is this now again at first glance they may this may just seem like a bunch of notation and not really important but let's think about why it is important suppose you solve this initial value problem and you find the solution to be x delta of t now if you take any other initial value problem that looks like this where f can be any continuous function any single continuous function that you want so that's just an absolute massive range of functions infinitely large uncountably large in that case you can immediately say exactly what the solution is with no fuss no muss it's simply the x delta convolved with f of t now there's still some computation to be done the convolution in general is not immediately a very nice function to work with because it involves an integral however you have a solution just straight away there's no long arduous process to go through to try to come up with solution you just immediately have it so if you can solve this one differential equation you now in some sense have solved a whole bunch of other differential equations or in particular initial value problem solving this one is in effect the skeleton key that unlocks all of these other differential equations or initial value problems. And you right away can say, here's the solution, that's it. So solving one, I guess it's like Lord of the Rings. One differential equation to rule them all. Now let's look at this in action because this is a lot of notation, but let's see it actually play out. Suppose you have some differential equation where L is a linear differential operator. It might be like X double prime plus three X prime plus X or something like this. Some on the left hand side, for the most part, constant coefficient linear differential equation on the left side. And we have this initial value information like we talked about. If it has this solution, like I said, the impulse differential equation is like the one differential equation to rule them all. It unlocks all the rest. So now let's say we want to know what is the solution to this differential equation. The left hand side is exactly the same. All we've changed is this function from the delta function to this one. We've kept the initial value data the same. We can right away, based on what we just saw, we can right away write the solution. That solution is simply five cosine 3t convolved with e to the negative 2t. Now again, if we want to compute that as a nice clean function that doesn't have any convolution there's some work to do some integration but we have something immediately the impulse response differential equation or in particular the initial value problem is the one differential equation to rule them all let's look at one final example say we want to start by finding the solution of this initial value problem again this is what we would call a linear differential operator well more specifically like an, we would use a different notation, but this is an example of an L of X on the left-hand side. It's equal to Delta T like we just saw. Now, if we take and apply the Laplace transform to both sides, we know the Laplace transform of just Delta T minus zero or Delta T equal to one. Going through the usual process here, which we'll skip all the gory detail just for a moment, we end up with the Laplace transform of X sub Delta, the solution to this thing, call x sub delta the one with delta here that's multiplied by s squared plus 3s plus 2 which notice is very similar to here as long as this is all zero then we solve for laplace of x delta explicitly and notice that we can factor this s squared plus 3s plus 2 divide, and then we factor we can then use partial fraction decomposition to get a over s plus 1 plus b over s plus 2 that's partial fraction decomposition. And if we go ahead and solve for A and B, what we'll get is that A is one, B is negative one. And now 
We can take the inverse Laplace transform of both sides at e to the negative t minus e to the negative 2. That is the solution x sub delta to this particular differential equation with this particular initial value. Now let's say we would like to find the solution to a similar differential equation where this is like the L of x we had before, where it's equal to f of t, same initial value information, but f of t is any continuous function, any single one that you could possibly imagine that's continuous, it's over here, doesn't matter. You think of it, that can be f of t if you want. We can find the solution to any of them. Again, the impulse delta initial value problem is the one differential equation to rule them all. We can now say that the solution to this initial value problem down here is just what we found up here, this solution, convolved with whatever that f is that you came up with. If you remember nothing else from this video, remember that the impulse response differential equation or initial value problem is the one initial value problem or differential equation to rule them all. I hope you found this video helpful. We'll see you in the next video. To view the next video in this series, click the link on the right. To view the last video in this series, click the link on the left. If you want to learn more about me, the nerd who's making these videos, visit the website below. And as always, have a good day.